of the Bible this morning? I'd like you to make your way over to the book of Acts chapter 1. We're going to look at a number of passages today uh, dealing with the same subject. Acts 1. And our text is going to be verse 8. We will look at a number of passages, but this is where we'll start. Acts 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. After that, that is when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. But you shall receive power. Amen. You know, the Lord gave his disciples here some very special instructions. If you back up with me to verse 1, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, Luke wrote the book of Acts. He is continuing in this book. He's picking up sort of where his gospel of Luke left off. And he's going to cover... Some of the same ground that he covered at the ending of Luke, which we'll see in a minute, but he covers some of that. You know, he backs up just a little bit to catch you up in the book of Acts. He says, the former treatise, the former epistle letter that I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. He's talking about the epistle, the gospel of Luke. He wrote that to Theophilus until the day in which he was taken up. He's speaking of the Lord being taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given suggestions unto the apostles. You all paying attention, right? At that he, that is the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, gave commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, that is, after his death, burial, resurrection. He showed himself alive by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So after his death, after his burial, he rose from the grave and for 40 days he appeared to his disciples. And he taught them during those 40 days. He spoke to them. And so I would say this is an infallible proof of the Lord's resurrection. Amen. And being assembled together with them, again we see, commanded them, not a suggestion, not telling them, you know, this would be a pretty good idea, but he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. And when they, therefore, will come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? We're ready. We're ready for Israel to throw off this Roman yoke, this Roman bondage. We're ready for your kingdom to be established. We're ready. We're ready for Israel to have power once again. He said unto them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his hands. Or he's put in his own power. It's not time for you yet. But you shall receive power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you'll be witnesses unto me. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You'll receive the Holy Spirit. He calls this the promise of the Father. 
He calls this the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he commanded them to go to Jerusalem until they received it. Now, the very end of the book of Luke covers some of this same ground. And and we're going to be turning kind of back and forth a little bit today from Acts 1 to Luke 24. So if you would, I would like you to make your way. Keep your finger here, but back to Luke's gospel, chapter 24, because this is the account of the Lord's, well, after his resurrection, beginning in verse 46, Luke 24, 46. He has risen from the dead. He has appeared to his apostles, his disciples. He says in verse 46, Luke 24, 46, that it is written... Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ, that is, it was necessary, to rise from the dead, to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And, this is what the Lord said to the disciples, because remember verse 46, he said unto them, he's speaking to the disciples, this is what he said, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. See, this is, we see him covering some of the same ground. You're to take the gospel first to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, the other most parts of the world. The Great Commission really is verse 46, or rather the gospel message, verse 46, that behooved Christ to die for our sins and be raised from the grave and And then that repentance should be preached, not really, you know, worldly prosperity, but repentance, repentance of sin should be preached. And when when there is repentance, true repentance and faith in Christ, there is remission, remission. It means pardon, forgiveness of sin. You can't preach forgiveness without preaching repentance. Because there is no forgiveness if there is no repentance. And you know what repentance means, right? Repentance basically means to turn, to turn around, to have a change in your way of thinking, a change in your way of living. It's a change of thinking that results in a change of of lifestyle. You turn around and you go the right direction. You, When a person repents... They no longer are continuing down the road that leads to hell. You know, there's this great broad road the Bible speaks of that goes to hell. And many there are that that travel that way. They're on their way to hell. The person who repents makes a U-turn. They don't just uh, veer off. And they're you're still on the wide, broad road. You have to make a U-turn. That's what repentance means. You change your mind. You change your direction. Yes. It changes your life. Yes. You change your mind about living a life of sin. You realize, I'm going the wrong way. Right. This is wrong. Right. God doesn't approve of my life. It's, there's a conviction involved that brings repentance. We turn around. We go in the right direction. That brings Forgiveness of sin, remission, pardon. There's something wonderful that takes place when a person repents. Because not only, not only are, are we forgiven of what we've done. It's like we're released, we're pardoned, but our record is expunged. Which is so much more. Our record is expunged, and as the Lord says, our our sins and iniquities he will remember no more. A change of mind, a change of heart, a change of direction, because we realize that the Lord has such a better way for us to live. There's such a better way to live. Life, Life has its trials. Life has its mountains to climb. But, you know, through this life, there are joys, there are privileges, there are comforts that we cannot have apart from Christ. You're right. Thank you, Lord. 
We change direction because we're gonna, we want to head to a better destination than where the world is headed. That's for sure. So we're to preach. This is the message of, he tells the disciples, repentance, remission of sins shall be preached in my name among all nations. Begin at Jerusalem. And you are eyewitnesses of these things because they were there. For his passion, that is his crucifixion and all the suffering he went through and his death and his resurrection. And behold, notice verse 49. This is one of our key verses. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But wait, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried away, carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So much of the same things that he said in Acts 1, he says here in Luke chapter 24, we're to bring a message of repentance and remission of sins Amen. to the whole world. He said, Amen. to the uttermost parts of the earth, he said in Acts 1.8, to all nations, Matthew 28, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16. This is what we are called to do. Amen. Now, these men were eyewitnesses. That means they were convinced of the Lord's resurrection. They saw with their own eyes. They knew he rose from the dead. He had been meeting with them for 40 days. They had firsthand knowledge and experience. And yet the Lord told these men, you go wait for the promise of the Father. You go wait to be endued with power from on high. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses. Amen. I, I want to talk about this today because I think it's important for us to consider a few things that heretofore, perhaps, we have not thought of in this way. We are a Pentecostal church. Right. So as a Pentecostal church, we would be considered very conservative. Very, very, very <laughs> conservative. Yeah. Yet we believe in a Pentecostal experience. That is, we believe in a mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit Amen. that is separate from and subsequent to salvation. Amen. It's not one and the same thing. There is, a, there is salvation that we receive and we are truly saved. Yeah, right. Truly saved, as we're going to see this morning. And yet, after salvation, there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit Jesus called it an endowment with power from on high. An endowment. Interesting word. It means to be clothed. It means to put on a garment. That's, that's what it means. You actually, the word you'll be endued, in, this endowment with power from on high, it means to sink into it. You sink into a garment. Kind of like you sink into water when you're baptized, water baptized. You sink into the water. Right. Well, you sink into this garment. You're endued with power. So there is such a thing as water baptism. Right. Every, every true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ right. should be identified with Christ in being water baptized, by being water baptized. Amen. This is where we cast off the old, we put on the new. This is where we declare to, to the whole world... I am a disciple of Christ. I'm forsaking the old life. The old me died and is buried in the waters of baptism, raised to a new life in Jesus Christ. It's, a, it's actually a command that we're to be baptized. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, have not been baptized as a believer, then you should be. If you were baptized you know, by being sprinkled as an infant, that's not baptism. That's, that's just a religious rite that does nothing, means nothing. It's just religion. Amen. 
Baptism means to be immersed, to be plunged, to be dipped. And, uh, when, and you have to be a believer to be baptized. If you're not a believer, infants are not believers. You have to believe, repent, commit your life to Christ, and then you should be baptized in water as a public declaration of your faith. And yet, after water baptism, there is another baptism. Uh, or at least, it doesn't have, have to happen. It doesn't have to happen after water baptism. It could be almost simultaneous with salvation. But there is the promise of the Father that Jesus spoke of here. The promise of the Father, which is the same thing as this endowment with power from on high, which is the same thing as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Amen. The endowment of power from on high. That is, that is, you are clothed with power from God. Amen. Clothed with power from God. Power, dunamis, the Greek word dunamis. And it means power, strength, ability. It, it is where we get our word dynamite. It's not mere human power. Some of, some of us may be very strong, may have much ability, uh, but this is more than human power. Right. You see, the Lord was preparing the disciples for the greatest task in all the world. Yeah. And that was to reach all the world with the gospel message. Yeah. To do this, they would need more than human power, human ability, human talent, the human powers of persuasion. They would need more. They would need power from God. They would need Power from above. Amen. Jesus said that this power is what the Father promised. Yes. He called it the promise of the Father. Where was that mentioned? It's mentioned back in the, in the book of Joel. You don't have to turn there, but if, if you want to, you can. Joel chapter 2. Joel prophesied. Joel, the Old Testament prophet, yes. prophesied this about the last days. He said, it shall come to pass that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Now, you see, the Holy Spirit would be poured out in special ways on particular individuals at times in the Old Testament. Samson had a unique uh, gifting of, of God's Spirit for a unique time and a, a unique purposes. And then there were the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, where the Holy Spirit would be poured out on them to prophesy and to write, you know, we got the writing prophets that gave us the Old Testament scriptures. But in the New Testament dispensation, we'll call it, Joel prophesied that God would pour out his spirit on all flesh. Amen. On all flesh. And men, women, he says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Yes, right. Not just the priests, not just the prophets. Not just the ones particularly anointed for particular tasks, whether it's a Gideon or a Samson or a, a Eli or a Samuel. Amen. He said, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. He's talking about anointed dreams. Amen. Dreams where the Lord will actually speak, speak to our hearts and minds. Your young men will see visions. He said, upon the servants and upon the handmaidens. That's, from, that's the very least among us. So it's not just the big, important potentates, movers and shakers, but the servants, the handmaidens, the least among us, the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon. He says, I will pour out my Spirit upon them in those days. That, that includes you and me, brothers and sisters. Amen. We're the handmaidens. We're the servants. We're not the big important people in the world. As far as the world thinks, we're nobodies. We're just, who are we? But to the Lord, he said, in those days, I'm going to pour my spirit out upon all flesh. Men and women, boys and girls, so that's young and old. If they're old enough to know the Lord, they're old enough to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. Right, 
and receive the promise of the Father. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. He goes on in that same passage in Joel's uh, letter, Joel's prophecy. And he said, and there will be signs. I will show signs and wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon unto blood before that great and terrible day of the Lord. So this mighty outpouring is associated with the last days and the judgments of the last days. This is what Jesus called the promise of the Father. He told his disciples, you go wait for the promise of the Father, and it will come upon you. Which it did, Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost was fully come, and we see specifically what came upon them, tongues like a fire settled upon each of them that was gathered in the upper room. They began to prophesy and speak with tongues. and uh, But that could not have been, not to jump ahead of myself, but just that could not have been the complete fulfillment of this prophecy because that was 2,000 years ago. It indicates to me that there is yet to be an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit that will be associated with the very last of the last days as judgments befall the earth. It gives me hope for a latter day outpouring of God's Spirit and a latter day revival. I know that in the last days there's going to be a great false revival. I know that. I know that in the last days there's going to be a great falling away from the faith. The Bible tells us these things. I think the great false revival will be a part of that. It will be a great deception, a great delusion that will not actually, not actually bring repentance. A revival is going to bring repentance. A true revival is going to bring, bring repent, repentance and not just hype. But I do have the hope and the expectation, actual expectation, because of the promise of the Father of Joel 2, that there will be in the latter day an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit just before, just before the world plunges into the darkness of the Great Tribulation. But I want us to focus a little bit today on this word power that the Lord told his disciples, you will receive power. You will receive power. Acts 1, 8. You will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. This baptism of Holy Spirit power, power beyond yourself. Power beyond your ability, power beyond your ability to pray, to preach, to witness, power beyond your ability to testify, power beyond your ability to prophesy. I mean, this is power that we need. Jesus called it power from on high, power from above, which makes it a supernatural power, not just human ability, but a supernatural power. You're going to need this. Jesus told his disciples, before you go into all the world and tackle the greatest task of all time, you need to be clothed with this power, this Holy Spirit power. We need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We need this endowment of power from on high to live the Christian life in this world that is so hostile to Christianity and growing more hostile by the day. We need this power from on high. To obey Christ's commands. Amen. You're going to struggle. You're going to struggle with this power. Yeah. But without it, yes. you cannot overcome. Yes. You cannot overcome the obstacles, the trials, the difficulties. You, will, right. you, will, you are struggling unnecessarily. Right. When you can have power. Power to overcome. If we are going to love 
as we should. Love others. Feel compassion for people who are evil. Pray. Love our enemies. You're going to need all the power you can get. You're not going to do this in your own strength and might. If you're going to die to this flesh, this self and its cravings, if you are going to crucify this flesh of yours and overcome your anger, your temper, your pride, you're not going to do this in your might. You're not going to do it. You're going to struggle helplessly with flesh that you can't overcome in your own might. You need power from on high. You need a supernatural power that will enable you to be my witnesses, Jesus said. To be my witnesses, martyro, you will be able to die. That's the idea. Amen. Die to flesh, die to self, die to pride, die to ego, die to having your way. Amen. You will be able to love others as Christ loved. You're going to need this power. Right. How can we point people to... To live a Christian life, how can we tell them you have to live this Christian life when we can't live it ourselves? When our lives are terrible testimonies. Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to send you out as a lamb among wolves. I'm going to send you out as a lamb among wolves. What chance does a lamb have among wolves? Well, I want you to think about this. Think about it this way. There is a world of darkness outside there. A darkness so perverse and so evil. There is unimaginable evil in this world. Unimaginable. If we are going to confront this evil... And overcome it. It will not be in our own power. That's right. Amen. You're right. Jesus told his disciples, do not go until you be clothed with power from God. Endued with power from on high. In World War II, I know I, know I use uh, illustrations from World War II sometimes often, but... This past week, uh, I, I watched some films from the Seventh Army after the liberation of Auschwitz, one of the Nazi death camps. And it, it made me look again at the evil power of Nazism that, that swept across Europe in World War II. You know, that wasn't very long ago, really. Some of you were living when when this happened. I mean, this is really just really within reach of our lifetime. We could throw a rock back to how long ago it was. But when this dark cloud of Nazism swept over Europe, in no time at all, it it conquered the entire European continent. Twenty countries swallowed up just like that. Some countries could not resist more than just a few days, some just capitulated. They couldn't stop. The Nazi war machine was unlike anything the world ever saw. It was so powerful. It was so brutal. It was so ruthless. It, it couldn't be stopped. There was nothing like it before in human history. If you saw a map, in fact, I, I challenge you, go home, Google a map of what Europe looked like in, in World War II, 1944, say, and you will see... All of Europe, northern Africa, Russia, parts of Russia, because they were conquering Russia. All of that was German occupied. The only one little spot right above uh, Italy, Switzerland, neutral. They left it alone. But the rest, the rest of Europe, only Great Britain was left. Only Great Britain, that little island right off the coast of France that was standing against this gigantic, monstrous evil of Nazism. When, in 1944, the the Allied powers, that would basically be the United States, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and then a few of our Allied friends like Australia and Canada and, 
and some others, they said, we've got to go take Europe back from this evil, this monstrosity that is Adolf Hitler. And Amen. I want you to imagine, that, that's where D-Day came in, you know, invading Europe to take back the continent of Europe from Nazi Germany. Imagine that we've got all these hundreds of thousands of soldiers going to invade Europe to take it back from the evil Nazi powers, and they arm, they arm all the soldiers with beanbags. Say, here, go throw these at the Germans. Throw them as hard as you can. We're going to drive them back. When this, this monstrous evil war machine, the Germans, had amassed, no, if you're going to go after that evil power, you're going to need more power. You're going to need more power than what they have. You're going to have to overwhelm their power. It was the greatest invasion in human history, the D-Day invasion. And it, uh, it reminds me of the monstrous evil in this world that you and I face. And we haven't even seen it bear its fangs yet but it will and it will I believe in our lifetime we too have a great task the allied powers had to push back Nazi Germany and get them out of get them out of Europe you and I have to carry out the great commission which is to take the gospel to the entire world to preach the gospel, to live the gospel. Yes. Amen. Live it. Yeah. We have to live this gospel. But you know, we fight a very evil power, a very evil power. Oh, yeah. To fight an evil power and to take that ground away from it, you need a greater power. Come on. We must have a greater power. Yeah. Jesus called it power from on high. Yeah. You must have power from on high. You must have the Holy Spirit. To enable you to defeat an adversary that cannot be defeated in your own might. Remember Ephesians 6. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Yep. Our, our enemy, your and my enemy, is not mere humans. Yeah. We wrestle against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places, against the very, the very demonic powers that govern the darkness of this world. We fight against demonic forces, and we fight against it every day. We fight against evil powers that govern this world, the world of darkness. We fight against powerful spiritual entities that control all the evil under heaven. There is power from below, and it is strong. And there is power from above, and it is stronger. We must be endued with power from on high. The power from below is strong. In fact, it's stronger than us. But the power from above is stronger still, stronger than all. And we must have this power. Jesus knew his disciples much have this power. Great is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I send you, he said, I send the promise of my father upon you. But wait in Jerusalem. Till you be endued with power from on high. That's a key verse. Amen. That's Luke 24, 49. The other key verse, Acts 1, verse 8. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. Amen. We need this power, Lord Jesus. We need it desperately. Amen. I want to remind you of something else that I think we perhaps overlook. When Jesus told his disciples, you go wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. When he said, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. When he told them, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Who was he talking to? His disciples his disciples who had been with him for 40 days. Resurrection appearances for 40 days. This was not a 
backslidden, lethargic bunch of half-hearted, lukewarm believers. They were sold out. They were convinced. You couldn't get more convinced than they were convinced. They'd been with the Lord for 40 days, seen him resurrected for 40 days. He'd been teaching them for 40 days. These people were sold out. You can't get more sold out. Amen. 40 days with Jesus. They were persuaded. They were persuaded. They were believers. They were convinced. They were committed. They were fervent. They were full of fire. In fact, they were ready to go into the fire. He wasn't talking to discouraged believers who said he wasn't telling discouraged people, well, you, you need a little something more. He was talking to people who were convinced. He was talking to people who were saved. In fact, you couldn't get more saved than they were saved. I mention this because I think sometimes Christians in the 20, 20th, 21st century now, uh, think that, why would I need the baptism in the Holy Spirit? I'm saved. I'm already saved. I love the Lord. What more is there for me? I'm saved. I'm convinced. I'm persuaded. I'm, I'm a good person. These were all good, godly men and women. In fact, we read a couple of passages. We read Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, that after the Lord ascended from them, the Bible says he was carried up to heaven. The Bible says, Luke 24, 52, they worshipped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They were full of joy. They were continually in the temple praising God, blessing God. They were worshipping the Lord. Amen. What I'm saying is these were not discouraged believers. Yeah. They were very encouraged. Uh, in Acts 1, they were continuing in prayer, in one accord, in the upper room, praying, praising, in supplication. I mean, so you've got a meeting in the temple, you've got them praying. These were fervent disciples, full of faith, full of joy, assembling together with great expectation. Here's a question I thought of. Suppose we met these disciples Suppose we met them before Pentecost. Suppose we met them, but after the ascension of the Lord, the Lord has ascended. They're waiting now on Pentecost. What would our impression have been of these men and women if we met them? Would we think, you know, these brothers and sisters, they're good, but they, they need something more. Would we think that? We would not. We would not think that for one minute. Amen. They were so full of faith, so full of love, so full of joy, so full of the word. The Lord had been teaching them for 40 days. They couldn't get more convinced. They were sold out. They were bold. They were, they were alive. Imagine being in their worship service. Imagine. You know, their worship service did not depend upon the talent of the musician or the singers. Their worship was all about one thing, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Amen. Jesus. Lord. Just love the Lord, praise the Lord. Oh, Jesus, fill us, flood our souls. If we had met them, we'd say, these brothers have it. They've got it all. These brothers and sisters have it all going on. We would not leave there thinking they were uncommitted or that they were weak or that they needed anything, Amen. we would not leave their presence thinking that these Christians are somehow defective. That's right. You would not think that. No. Every one of them was on fire Praise. for Christ. Thank you, Lord. And you know, they had already had power manifested in their lives. They had, when the Lord was alive, they went out and prayed for the sick. People got healed. They went out, preached. They went out. People repented. People got delivered. And yet Jesus told this group of men and women, you go wait at Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. 
there was something more that they needed. Something more. How, how can we define it? How can we describe it other than this? Power from God. Power from God to be my witnesses. Doesn't mean we can't witness without the Holy Spirit, but how much more effective with it. If, especially if Jesus said, we need it. We need this power from on high. And then in Acts 2, they were, they were filled with power from on high. The Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with tongues. The Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Don't think that, that speaking in tongues is the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe speaking in tongues is important because it, it helps us have power in our prayer. But the power from on high is the supernatural power from God that enables us to live a holy life. Amen. It is the Holy Spirit who comes. The Holy Spirit. And people speak in tongues and live like devils. Yeah, that's Speaking in tongues is not uh, proof of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. A godly life. Now, godly life. If, I'm not saying that speaking in tongues is unimportant. It's, it is important. It's part of the power. Power, powerful prayer. Powerful prayer enables our prayer life. We're going to talk about this more in the next few weeks. But I want you to see something else in John's Gospel, chapter 14. Would you mind turning over there? Just a second. Turn over here with me. I want you to see what the Lord said about this baptism in the Holy Spirit. John's Gospel, chapter 14. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit is also a fulfillment of what the Lord promised. John 14, beginning in verse 15. John 14, 15. If you love me, Keep my commandments, or if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. See, the Lord physically, personally, was going to be crucified, resurrected, and then ascend. So he would not physically be there with them forever. But he said, I'll pray that the, the Father will send you another comforter, and he will abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. This is the Holy Spirit, who is called the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. No, the Holy Spirit's not for the world. It's not for the lost. It's not for the unsaved. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him. You know the spirit of truth. You know him. And, and notice these words. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Amen. He dwells with you. The Holy Spirit dwells with you. But he shall be in you. Being with you, being in you. That's the difference. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. The Greek word means orphans. I will not leave you orphans. You won't be left on your own. Notice, I will come to you. Thank you, Lord. You know, there is a sense in which wherever Christ is, the Father is, the Holy Spirit is. Because you cannot separate God. God is one, one God. Three eternal manifestations of the one God. But let's remember Colossians, what is it, Colossians 1, 9, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Where Christ is, the Holy Spirit is, the Father is. Where the Holy Spirit is, Christ is, the Father is. Where the Father is, the Son is, the Holy Spirit is, because God is not divided. And yet we have three eternal personalities within the one Godhead. But isn't it interesting? He said, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I will come to you. 
And yet it's going to be another comforter, another, that's one of the same kind, another comforter, paraclete, the one who comes alongside of us. The spirit of truth. I want to, I want to point out something that, y'all with me? Okay, y'all awake? All right, the comforter, the, the footnote in my Bible of uh, John fourteen sixteen says, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit another comforter. Comforter translates the Greek parakletos, meaning literally one called alongside to help. This is a rich word, meaning comforter, strengthener, counselor, helper, advisor, advocate, ally, and friend. And the Greek word another is alon, meaning another of the same kind, rather than heteros, meaning another of a different kind. In other words, the Holy Spirit continues what Christ himself did while on earth. Jesus promises to send another comforter. The Holy Spirit will do for the disciples what Christ did for them while he was with them. The Spirit will be by their side to help and strengthen them, to teach the true course for their lives, to comfort in difficult situations, to intercede in prayer for them, to be a friend, to further their best interest, and to remain with them forever. <coughs> Power. I mentioned that I had watched a, a, some documentary film about the liberation of Auschwitz and some of the other horrible death camps that the Nazis had occupied. And I actually cried watching these watching these films. I just burst out in tears when you realize there were mountains of corpses, mountains of corpses when they liberated these death camps, mountains of dead men, women and children, mountains of the unburied. They would bury 5,000 at a time, 5,000, 5,000, 5,000, 5,000. That's not even counting the ones that were cremated in their crematoriums. The evil, the evil of these death camps, they know that 6 million Jews were killed. They were, either, they were either gassed, they were shot, they were beaten to death. They were horribly mistreated. Some were experimented on with the most bizarre medical experiments. But it wasn't just Jews. Six million Jews died. But millions and millions of Romanians died. Gypsies died. Political dissidents died. Anyone who opposed Nazism died in the death camps. Shot. Executed one cruel way after another. Tens of millions died. And watching this film, I couldn't help but cry. I just burst into tears. And then... I thought about this word power. I thought about how dark, how evil, what an evil power there is in this world. Powers of evil that are unfathomable. Powers of wickedness that you and I actually have a hard time imagining. There are powers in this world that are so dark, so evil, so vile, yeah. and yeah. so powerful that we must have power from on high Amen. in order to overcome and endure, right. especially since I, I, I fully believe that this evil power will soon bear its fangs again right. and rise up under the control of Antichrist, who, who will actually eclipse in far, in far more wicked ways anything that Hitler ever did. Amen. I believe Hitler was a forerunner of the Antichrist. Wow. But there is an evil rising up in our world, unlike anything we have ever seen before. The Bible tells us that it's coming. The Bible tells us that it will be preceded by this great, great falling away from the faith. As multitudes are deluded and deceived, uh, many are just lulled to sleep. Multitudes will just allow their love to grow cold and, and just filter back into the world, 
holding on to some semblance of religion, but, but their hearts will be well, captured by the world. There will be, I believe, a great false revival in the last days that will sweep many away, but it will be totally false. Those who have the Holy Spirit will be discerning enough to know that this is not the Lord. This is not the Lord. We need, we need the power of the Holy Spirit, the discernment that he brings, the leadership, the guidance, the counsel, the strength that the Holy Spirit brings. You know, the church in the 21st century has a lot of things. We've got a lot of talented people. Talented people. I mean, in the pulpit and, and in music ministry in our world, we've got talented teachers and preachers and we've got musicians, we've got choirs, we've got concerts, we've got organization. We've got sermons and sermons and sermons. We've got great music. We've got education. We've got people so scholarly. We've got programs and committees. We've got meetings and hype and enthusiasm. We've even got prayer. We need power. We need power. We need this power from on high. Our task, our task is to live a victorious life in Jesus Christ our Lord, to live a life uncontaminated by the sins around us so that we can live in a vile, filthy, ungodly, hostile world and not be tainted by it. And so that we can present a consistent witness to others of the love and grace and salvation that Christ offers. Amen. We need the Holy Spirit. Right. We need it desperately. We need all the firepower that God has to offer us. Amen. We can't combat what's ahead no. with talent and human ability right. and even, even our own brilliance or cleverness or powers of persuasion. There is a monstrous evil in this world. There is a power from below, and it is strong. But there is greater power from above, and we must have it. God equips us with this power in order for us to overcome. Now, beloved, there is a question that Paul asked in the book of Acts, chapter 19, to the disciples in Ephesus. He said, have you received the Holy Spirit? Since becoming a believer, have you received? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Now, the answers can only be this in our generation. Yes, no, or I don't know. Yes, no, or I'm not sure. Yes, no, I don't know. If you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you know it. If you don't know, then perhaps... You have it. Amen. How do I get this Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus said you ask. That's all he said. Ask. Ask it shall be given to you. Everyone that asks receiveth, he says. Luke chapter 11. Everyone that asks receives. He that seeks finds. To him that knocks it shall be opened. He said if a son asks bread of any of you that is a father, you have a son? If he said, Dad, would you give me bread? Would you instead give him a rock and say, here, here, eat this? Would you do that? Eat this rock. No. no, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that at all. Or if he asked for a fish, would you give him a serpent? No. Or if he asked for an egg, would you say, well, here's a scorpion. Eat this. No, you wouldn't do that. No. And then here's what the Lord said. If you then, being evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. That is, you won't give them some substitute, something that will hurt them, something evil. You wouldn't do that. Then how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? He will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. He is not reluctant to give it. He is not in any way hesitant or reluctant. He's not going to withhold it if you ask him for the Holy Spirit. You need it. 
I need it. We need it. We need all the firepower that God has to give us. Have you received since you believed Acts 19? Which means it's not the same thing as being, as being saved. It's subsequent to and separate from, and yet it can come. It can come almost simultaneously. My question, have you asked? Have you asked? Have you asked in faith and believe you receive when you pray? That's the way we pray. We believe. Look, when the Lord says he'll give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him, the Lord's not going to lie. He will not lie. Well, how do I know it's the Holy Spirit? Because he won't give you a rock. He won't give you a scorpion. He won't give you a serpent. If you ask him for the Holy Spirit, he will give you the Holy Spirit. Ask him for the Holy Spirit. Lord, flood my soul with your Holy Spirit. Let me be endued with this power from on high. Lord, I need everything you have for me. Let me not be reluctant. Let me not be hesitant. Let me not be so bound with my religious tradition. Ask, it will be given you. Open your heart. Open your heart. Receive the mighty Holy Spirit from God. By faith, open your heart. Open your mouth. Believe. Believe you receive when you pray. Let the Lord fill your soul, fill your heart with his mighty, his mighty endowment of power from above. We simply ask. Amen. You don't have to climb a mountain. That's good. You don't have to crawl on your knees up stone steps. Thank you me. ask. It is the Father's delight to answer this prayer Thank you, and fill you with his Holy Spirit. Amen. If you've never asked, ask. Amen. If you've asked but you're not sure whether you've received, then ask and believe. Ask and believe that right now, Lord, I thank you that you filled me with your Holy Spirit just as you promised. Amen. You know, when you pray to be forgiven, yeah. you're not waiting for a sign, are you? Okay. Like, I prayed for God to forgive me, but I don't know if he did. I'm not sure because I didn't feel nothing. When we, when we confess our sins, we know he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So we believe at that moment we are forgiven. We don't wait for feelings. We believe we're forgiven and we thank him for forgiving us. When you pray for the Holy Spirit, you believe that he comes. As you ask, he comes. And you thank the Lord for it and ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit in all his fullness. Not just a partial baptism. You jump in all the way. Lord, baptize me in your Holy Spirit. Come now. Flood my soul. Let me receive as I ask you for the Holy Spirit. Send the Holy Spirit upon me now. And I believe that you do it even now. Even now. I receive it by faith and confess that I have it. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, believe it. Now, we know that in the book of Acts, they received the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We know they spoke in tongues. We know they prophesied. We see it in Acts 2. We see it in Acts 10. We see it in Acts 19. The same, we see the same thing that happened. I won't say that... Uh, Speaking in tongues is the ultimate evidence of having received, but it is an initial, it seems to be an initial evidence in the New Testament. And I would encourage you to ask the Lord to give you that language of prayer that adds power. There is a power in Holy Ghost prayer. We're told in Jude 20 that we're to build up ourselves in our most holy faith, praying, praying in the Holy Spirit. If you've never done that, ask the Lord, ask the Lord to grant you this grace. He'll give it to you. Take it by faith. 
Take it by faith. Praise Him. Pray. Pray in the Holy Spirit. You know, I remember somebody telling me, when, well, 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 Brother Rusty, just, just pray. And I said, I'm praying, I'm praying. He said, well, quit praying in English. I don't know no other language. It took a while for me to realize that uh, the Holy Spirit's not going to take my jaw. The Holy Spirit's not going to take my tongue and just talk out of me. The Bible says they spake as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And actually, I was driving in my car on my way to work one day. And just the Holy Spirit, just the presence of the Holy Spirit came over me so strong. I had to pull over on the side of the road. I was crying. And next thing you know, I was praying in the Spirit. And I haven't stopped since. Paul said, I will pray with my understanding and I will pray with the Spirit. And we want to be able to do that, to pray with the Spirit. There is power in that, uh, in that prayer. Not that your pr- prayer in English isn't powerful, not that it isn't heard, but there is a power that takes us beyond our ability to pray. There is a power that takes us beyond our knowledge to pray. And there is a power that takes us beyond, beyond our limitations in prayer. Because we have limitations. But the Holy Spirit... He's bigger than we are. Father, I do pray today that you will fill us one and all with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you will apply your word to our hearts and help us to see, Lord Jesus, your perfect will for us all. Because, Lord, we know we need all the power, all the firepower, all the firepower that you that you provide to live, to overcome to live victoriously, to glorify you in an evil day. Lord, fill your people, one and all. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen.